Hi everybody, good evening. Welcome to our Backyard Chooks webinar presented by the City of Burundara. My name is Liz and I'm uh, one of the Senior Sustainability Officers in the Environmental Sustainability Team at the City of Burundara. My role is largely in community engagement. I try and get the community on board with doing all things environmental. Um, I work with schools, I work with businesses, and I work with residents like yourselves. I run lots of events and workshop uh, services and subsidy programs, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them at the end of our webinar. Before we start, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, past, present, and future. And we're all sitting on different lands, I imagine, we're probably spread far and wide. Um, so I'm not gonna name any particular countries at all. Um, so thank you very much. One, one more reminder, please keep yourselves on mute. If you do wish to ask a question, please feel free to use the chat function. Feel free to ask Chucky related questions or council related questions. I'll do my best to answer them and Ella will do her best. Whatever Ella doesn't cover during the workshop, she will attempt to answer at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'd just like to welcome Ella Boyan from Chooktopia. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you. Now I'll just uh, have a bit of a play with the spotlight so that it's um, not too confusing about who's talking. And as my eyes glance up, it's just because I'm admitting people from the weight room. Okay, so welcome, thanks for coming. Now I do have a sound filter on, so I'm not sure how much of this background sound you can hear. <laughs> The chickens are a bit vocal today, so I might look a bit distracted trying to see if there's an egg popping out somewhere. <laughs> um, oh, you can hear the chooks, fabulous. <laughs> so, um, yes, if they get a bit too loud, let me know and I will change my filter so that you can't hear quite as much background sounds. So, um, but yeah, it's quite inspiring. Um, so we'll get started. I'll do a combination of screen sharing, background and showing you around um, here as well, practical examples so that you can hopefully feel really inspired by the end of the session on keeping chooks. Uh, and now you hear from chooks, all good. <laughs> so um, yes, we'll, um, we'll sort of do a bit of a combination as we work through. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Uh, and just running through the overview of the presentation. So bear with me, move my dialogue over there. Okay. Now the only problem with this screen sharing is you can probably see all my controls at the top and everything at the side. So hopefully that's not too distracting for you, um, but I'll pop things up as a background too if we need them. So, um, so keeping backyard chooks, um, I'm assuming that a lot of people here already do or have. Um, so feel free to pop advice in the chat as well as people ask questions because we'll have some time at the end for a bit of chatter. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll run through the basics of the session. So I've structured it by running through the benefits of chooks, just in case you're not already sold on the idea of chooks. Maybe you're convincing someone else. That's usually where this bit comes in handy. Um, so use some of these tips to, to share with someone else um, why it's a good idea to get chooks. A question I get asked of quite a lot is what breed should I get? What breed chooks should I get? So we're going to look a little bit about the breed, a couple of different sort of groups of breeds and the pros and cons. We're going to look at how to read your chooks, um, sort of to understand their health and well-being and happiness, uh, and which leads into their basic needs. So we're going to look at the food, water, shelter. Uh, we're going to touch on health and hygiene. I'm by no means an expert, I'm by no means a vet at all, um, so I'm a, I'm a generalist. So again, if you've got some great tips of things that you've tried, add them to the chat as we go, um, because, you know, it's that collective peer-to-peer -peer knowledge that's um, really fantastic to share with everyone. We're going to have a look at council requirements in general and then uh, for Borodara, um, it is different in every council area, but there are a lot of similarities. And of course, time for questions before we have a look at some of um, council's other sustainability programs that you might be interested in. So without further ado, 
Um, just looking at the benefits of chooks. Just, I know you're all on mute, but maybe pop in the chat if my sidebar of my screen's distracting for you. No, I can't actually see the chat anyway while I'm sharing. That's okay. Um, I might just minimize that. Hopefully that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a bit more viewing <laughs> space. If I can see the chat, um, everybody said no, it's fine. So thank you. Right. Yeah, I'm not too sure with the sharing of screen how much it shares when I'm in a presenter mode. So um, I usually need to look back at the video later to check. <laughs> um, so obviously there's so many benefits of keeping chooks, most of which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, personally for me, a really big one is the animal welfare. Uh, really passionate about you know, seeing an end to factory farming and, you know, all those practices that don't have the animal's welfare front of mind. Um, so for me, it's about having healthy, happy animals, healthy, happy pets. Um, and then, of course, there's all these other great things like they control the bugs around your garden. Um, they give you great eggs to eat. They give you free fertilizer. They make great, pet, great pets. Um, there's all the other food ethics that goes with factory farming and of course the food miles as well, which is a whole nother topic we won't go into today. So there's so many amazing benefits of having chooks. Then of course there's um, the nutrition and benefit health uh, factors for ourselves. And as a waste education person, I'm also really passionate about closing the loop in our own backyard. So we basically can feed our chooks our food scraps and then they turn them into beautiful eggs. So we continue to close that loop, um, which is something really exciting from an environmental perspective. Uh, so in terms of choosing breeds, if I can catch a chook, I will and hold it up. Um, I'm just going to unshare for a sec because the screen, it doesn't really show. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to keep kind of moving my screen around throughout the session. Which way are we going? Over here. We have down here, you can see some little chickens with uh, sort of fluffy pom-pom heads and there's a little black bantam, Pekin bantam down there. There's some old English game. So there's a few different types of um, breeds here. Now the main sort of breeds that you'll find people talk about are uh, uh, either your, your industrial layers, like your eyes are browns and, and that type of thing, or where am I talking from? Uh, I'm in Lang I'm in Langwara in Southeast Melbourne. Um, so, and it's a friend's sheep in the backyard. <laughs> um, so I personally have moved away from eyes of browns and all the commercial layers. Uh, and I keep a flock of mostly fancy chooks. Um, so a mixture of all, all different sorts of bantams um, from Polish uh, to Pekin to, I've got a frizzle here. Um, I've got some old English game. And what else do I have? That's pretty much the most of it now. So the, for me, the main reason moving away from the commercial layers was we don't need many eggs. Um, we get far more eggs than we can ever use and we just end up giving them all away. Um, so producing a high quantity of eggs wasn't really a factor for us. Um, what was important, sorry, got a bit of glare there. What was important for us, um, well, for me, I do a lot of education. Um, so, you know, I'll go and do an event and I'll bring chooks. So I want um, chooks that are quite small and friendly and <laughs> not attacking each other like those two just now. Um, and, you know, quite pretty chooks as well. Um, so I think there was a question about which are the best layers. So I'm just going to open it up. So the best layers are your commercial layers. So things like your eyes are brown, the, the, the bigger browner. On a hen. Um, I have found um, one of the issues with your commercial layers is because they're having uh, to produce an egg every day. It's a bit like, could you imagine having to ovulate every day? <laughs> um, it really takes a lot out of the body. So they tend to have a very short lifespan, a lot of health complications and being a high egg layer 
Um, they can have other issues such as impactions, so where the egg gets stuck in the duct and that sort of thing. Uh, it was all very complicated and I wanted something a bit easier. So for me, the, the smaller chooks, the fancy pretty chooks, um, such as all the various bantams, uh, is the fact that all well, one they're very cute to look at you know I have a toddler who loves to name them all based on how they look um, they we still get a lot of eggs from them uh, despite the fact that they're not as uh, robust egg layers and um, they go quite clucky so that's probably the downside of your smaller breeds your bantam breeds um, is they will spend a lot of their life sitting on eggs uh, and the downside of that apart from the fact that they're always just sitting on eggs, um, so you're not getting their eggs, is they can get my infestations and things like that. So, so there's sort of pros and cons of both. Um, a nice all round breed, something in the middle, um, would be a like a silver lace Wyandotte or a, a gold lace Wyandotte is um, a really nice middle ground. Um, they make good meat birds. If you, you know, looking at producing your own meat, they make great layers, um, but they're not as intensive layers as um, your eyes is. A question just popped up there, what's the best temperament in terms of breeds? And honestly, it really comes down to the individual chook. It's almost like saying, you know, what's the best personality of person based on race? It's, it's really the individual, the, where the personality is from so much as the breed. So I've had eyes of browns that are really snuggly and cuddly and others that are really aloof. Um, all mine at the moment are quite aloof because I don't really handle them much. It really will come down to how you um, spend your time with chooks. And if you're sitting outside every morning having a cup of tea and Vegemite toast with your chooks, I can guarantee within a few weeks, they're gonna be on your knee every morning <laughs> and really, really friendly. So they generally um, will start to show their personality and their temperament over time. So yeah, don't um, don't think it's restricted to a particular breed. Um, yeah, any, any chook with the right amount of, uh, you know, handling will become very friendly and cuddly. So um, roosters on the other hand, which you can't have in suburbia, but if um, anyone's, you know, lucky enough to spend any time out on a farm, uh, once a rooster turns nasty, then you're usually in a bit of trouble. <laughs> Um, oh yes, and someone's just saying chooks are very friendly when you have bread. Um, yes, that's that's pretty much a given. So if, if they realise that you're the one that feeds them, they're going to start running to you every time you feed them. Um, I've got a video up on YouTube of just opening up the shed of a morning and all the chooks just all flying out towards the camera because that's where they know the food is. So um, yeah, that's basically sort of an overview with the breeds. Um, so yeah, my favourite breed um, is a Wyandotte because it is that nice happy medium, but I'm quite partial to the Polish because they, um, they're not too bad in terms of cluckiness like other small breeds um, and they're just spectacular. They have the, the big grizzly head um, and really hard where the sun is, but as they move closer to me, I'll keep sort of moving the camera onto them so that you can get a better look. There's the frizzle, one of the frizzle roosters behind me. Yeah, whoops. Where'd it go? Oh, there. Sorry. Just in the middle there. I need a zoom function. <laughs> Okay, so I'll share my screen again. Oh, sorry, another quick question. What are the breeds? Oh, the breed that's a happy medium. And this is just my opinion. You'll find other chook breeders that um, will disagree. For me, it's a Wyandotte. So the gold lace or silver lace Wyandotte, I find a really beautiful breed. Um, lovely temperament. Uh, very few health issues. Good layers. Don't go too clucky. <laughs> okay, so I'll share my screen again to move to the next bit and then I'll unshare to show you things. Um, so in terms of reading chooks, it's really important to get to know your chooks very well. Um, so one well, one thing um, is you can read their comb, you can read their behaviour, uh, and you can even read their poop. So by having a good look at your chooks and getting to know them very well, knowing what's normal for them um, really helps you pick up if something's wrong. 
An important thing to know with chooks is being a prey species, they are very good at hiding any issues because as soon as they show weakness in the world, they're a target for a predator. So they will hide illness, they will hide injury, they will hide infestations, um, all sorts of things. They will even hide an impacted egg, so an egg broken inside them. Um, and usually by the time you notice something's wrong, it's often too late. So get to know your chooks really well, have a good look at them every day. Um, I definitely recommend the, the cup of tea technique. <laughs> so sitting out there having a cup of tea with them every day, if you can make the time. If you don't have the time, I think you should try to spend double, <laughs> as they say with meditation. So putting that time aside, um, just to spend time with them, get to know them. Um, so their comb, they're all quite far away and we've got a bit of sun glare, so I'll keep my screen shared for the minute. Um, so the, uh, their comb, you know, if it goes a bit purple or flops, like in the picture on the screen there, that can often be a sign that something's wrong. Uh, it, it doesn't tell you what's wrong, just that something's wrong. Um, and you can see with the smaller picture on the screen, um, that chook just looks really listless. So again, that I'd sort of look at that chook and think, oh, if I don't act within two days, it'll probably die. So um, get to know some of those signs. They will molt um, several times in a year. Um, so that's when they drop a lot of feathers. Sometimes they will look pretty much bald. So um, I give them extra feed, extra protein when they're molting. Uh, and that's usually enough to get them through and make sure obviously they've got the right amount of shelter. But also if they're molting and you think maybe they shouldn't be or they don't look quite right, have a look for uh, infestations such as mites or fleas in their skin. So um, again, it's a good idea just to have a good close look if something just seems a bit odd. Um, in winter, I give them extra feed as well, just because they're, um, you know, it's a bit cold and they've got to pack on a bit of body weight to, to keep nice and warm. In summer, I tend to give them less feed, but extra water. If you feed them a lot during summer, then you'll find um, that the energy, that extra energy taken to digest the extra food actually puts a lot more pressure on them. So things like watermelon and just lots of extra water are good in, uh, in summer. Um, in terms of egg production, I've sort of mentioned this when I was talking about breeds earlier. Um, I've never had issues with the egg production in your more sort of visual breeds, only in your commercial layers. Um, but if you do feel like your hen has an egg maybe stuck or malformed, or you've just noticed that, you know, sometimes the eggs are coming out really weird, um, jump on one of the forums online and share pictures if you can. There's so much amazing information out there on what you can do. I personally, I, we have a bird vet that lives near us. I just go straight to the vet. Um, I just don't know enough about it and I don't want to take the risk of, you know, trying to fix it myself. So I'll just go straight to the vet. Um, crop and comb, as I mentioned. So the crop is this area, I'm not sure if Many of you can see me as well, except for maybe just a little window of me on the screen. Um, but basically the area under the neck where they have a lot of food stored, um, you're wanting to see that fairly full most of the time. If they're not very well, that can be quite empty. Uh, and of course their comb I mentioned, it might go floppy, it might go purple, it might go black. Um, you, you've probably heard of chicken pox in humans. Well, there's chicken pox in chickens as well. So again, get to know their, their comb. And, uh, and look for changes. Now poop is a fun one. I'm not gonna gross you out with pictures today of poop, um, but their poop changes a lot. So they will have times where their poop is mustard color and frothy. And there will be times where their poop looks like regular old magpie poop with black and white. Um, and then everything in between. Um, but what you will find in their poop, if there's something wrong, um, if they've got blood in their poop, it could be coccidia, which is a parasite. Um, if they have, uh, you know, they might have worms in their poop. Um, you know, all sorts of other things. So poop tells you a lot and you can actually find a healthy chook poop chart 
uh, on the internet. So get on and have a search if you're a bit unsure. The first few times you see some of the really weird poops, you think something's wrong. Um, once you get to know that they're normal, then you'll you'll be able to notice quite easily when something's not normal. Now, Liz, I can't see the chat while I'm on this screen. So if there is a question relating to what I'm talking about, feel free just to chime in uh, and, and I can answer it on the spot, but everything else will save for the end. No problem. So <laughs> so in terms of basic needs of chooks, um, and I'll unshare my screen and show you a bit of other stuff in a minute. Um, basic needs, obviously, under the law a food, water, shelter, um, but also under um, animal health and safety and there's some birds flying above me. Gonna poop. <laughs> um, there's several um, animal welfare sort of pieces of legislation uh, that's states how uh, the sort of conditions animals need to be kept in and they need they need access to their own species for example um, that's just a given at the very least a mirror but having just one chook on its own being a, a herd a herd a flock animal um, it's really important that they have other members of their same species around or a similar species when I couldn't get a baby chook for one of my other baby chooks, I got a baby turkey. So um, just having that companionship is really important. Uh, and of course, happiness, things to do. Just being um, locked in a little cage with a dirt floor with no stimulation, no mental stimulation, uh, no enrichment can be really hard on them. So have a think about what sorts of things can make them happy in their yard. Um, and I'll show you a few examples around here as well. So first of all, I'm just going to unshare. Um, so first of all, looking at diet, obviously things like um, their crumble and their seeds. I'm going to spin around to, to try and get out of there. Glare, there we go. Move my chair. I'll just bring over an example of their food or a couple of examples. So it's important that chickens have protein and carbohydrates. They can't really digest, you know, your plant fibres and cellulose and that sort of thing. They will eat it a bit, you know, a bit of roughage is good, but they can't actually digest it and get any nutrients out of it. Um, so I've got, at the moment, this is crumble. How do we, there we go which is basically crushed up pellets because I've got a lot of babies in here. Um, pellets are really good because they're a balanced diet, really high in protein. They've got everything that the chickens need. So I do supplement their feed with that. Um, but also I give them a large area to dig around for bugs. If they're able to access worms and bugs and all sorts of things, then that's a complete diet. So think about what they would have in nature and try to mimic that if you can. So I've got the crumble here. Now with the crumble too, I'll just mention, um, you can get medicated and unmedicated crumble. The medicated crumble has um, a medication in it that stops the development of coccidiosis uh, in the young chickens. It should only really be fed for the first maybe six weeks of their chicken's um, life. And then they should have built up a natural resistance in the environment. Um, it is okay to feed it to them again, you know, if there's an outbreak of coccidia or anything like that later on down the track. Um, but otherwise you can get a non-medicated crumble as well. This is, and someone just said that I love, um, there's loves crickets. Um, yes, definitely. Mine, I've even tried to teach mine to eat snails because <laughs> I'm sick of snails eating my veggie patch. Um, the blue tongue lizards tend to be a better option, although it's harder to encourage them around your house. Um, but yeah, certainly um, getting them to eat, yeah, bugs, crickets, cockroaches, what else, worms, grubs, um, all sorts of things, beetles. Um, now this is from Kinder. Uh, kinder pick up today. I have a couple of buckets there every time my little one goes to kinder and I usually get a bucket full of rice uh, or pasta or similar and this one's a bucket full of fruit. So 
So I might actually give this one to the sheep, uh, not the chickens, because I know the sheep are really hungry <laughs> uh, and the chickens can eat anything. So um, yeah, so that's just a nice example of um, how to get food for free. You don't always have to buy food, um, but just keeping in mind that they need the carbohydrates uh, and they need the protein. But then something, you know, somewhere to dig and, um, and get all those other, other proteins and things as well. Now I'm just going to minimize my screen for a sec. Um, and one thing I will just mention too is um, a lot of people get really horrified when I mention that I'll feed my chickens chicken pizza. <laughs> um, chickens are omnivores, they will eat meat and plant material uh, and they need quite a lot of the meat material. If a chicken died in the woods and no one was there to hear it scream, its friends would eat it. <laughs> that, that's life. Um, that's that's just what chickens do. So it's not um, not a great deal of harm to feed chicken the chickens. I'll generally only feed it cooked because um, I don't want them to, you know, attack one, you know, that's got a sore or something. But if a chicken does have, I mentioned impaction where the egg breaks inside or gets stuck inside the other chook, um, chooks will often kill the other chook because there's blood present and it they basically see meat and go, oh, your food, uh, and they forget that they're friends. So just keep that in mind um, that you can feed them your leftover spag bowl, uh, you can feed them your chicken pizza, all sorts of things. Again, I do horrify some chicken breeders when I say that you can feed your eggs back to the chickens. Um, people say, oh, but that makes the meat their own eggs. It actually, if they're eating their own eggs, it's because they've got a nutritional deficiency and it's usually protein. Um, I feed eggs to my chickens. Like today I fed them about 10 eggs because um, they started laying in a spot that I didn't realize. And I had to, you know, I didn't know how long they'd been there. So I thought I'll just feed it back to them. Um, my chooks have never eaten their own eggs um, unless I pick them up, break them open and then present them to them. So um, generally, if they've got a good nutritional base, they won't eat their own eggs. Um, so it is fine to feed their eggs back to them. Um, now, any quick questions on feeding before I move on to health and well-being? No? No? OK. Um, so I might just share again. Once I work out how to make my screen big again, there we go. Share. Oh, what about grass? So they can and will eat bits of grass, but it doesn't give them any great nutritional benefit because they can't actually digest the cellulose. Um, sorry about that pop up. Um, whoops, too far. So um, in terms of keeping them healthy, um, we, we hear a lot about mites because that's probably one of the most common things, especially at this time of year, you'll get a lot of mites. Hopefully that sun's not too bright now. Um, mites is one of the main outbreaks that I get here. There's a lot you can do to prevent mites. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute, but I'll just quickly run through a few of the other issues. Um, Heat is a major killer of chooks, the so heat stress. They really don't do well in heat waves. They're fine in winter. They can cope with the cold, but they don't cope with the heat. Um, worms as in intestinal worms, not the worms they eat, um, are a big killer of chooks as well. And just stress, stress or shock as well. Um, they will often bully each other to death. I've lost a few chooks to bullying. Uh, and there's, again, it'll probably come up in questions, but there's a few different ways to introduce chooks together. So this flock here, I've only recently introduced uh, a small rooster and a lot of really young chooks, like 
uh, about eight weeks old, six to eight weeks old, uh, introduced them to the existing flock, which also had a rooster. So I was a bit worried about that because roosters are really hard to introduce, but chooks in general are hard to introduce. Um, so we had uh, a yard within a yard so that they could get to know each other through the fence, but not do damage to each other and, uh, and got all the newbies to bond into a flock so that when they came into the new flock or the original flock, there were two set flocks and they tend to just go their own separate ways. Uh, whereas if you introduce just a single one, it'll be pretty much bullied to death. Now I'm going to unshare again so I can show you, remind me to show you uh, heat and mites. Okay. So in terms of heat, I just got this from my hardware store. Um, so I don't know if you can hear that, but they're really loud. <laughs> uh, it's basically a sprinkler, uh, a mister, um, a hose, it's sort of fixed shape. So you just plug it into your hose and it sends out a really, really fine mist. <laughs> amazing during um, heat waves because just that fine mist, it cools the atmosphere around them and just gives them uh, a bit of relief. Uh, and I find they actually will spend time under, under it, under the water. So I think I paid about I don't know, $35, $40 or something for that at the hardware store. Um, best thing ever, I used to have all sorts of other sprinklers, but the fine mist is a godsend in summer. Um, I don't know if you can hear him, but he's really distracting for me. <laughs> wow. Um, another thing that I've got uh, just to help them through heat waves is I've got quite a lot of waterers. Oh, and someone's got a solar fan. Yes, that is on my wish list, a solar fan. Um, definitely. So you can put a solar fan up in their house and it just keeps circulating the air and it has a cooling effect of up to about five degrees. It's really quite effective. Um, this is just a food grade bucket with these little waterers on. It's empty at the moment. Um, so these little waterers I just got from a um, livestock or chook supplier. Um, you might be able to get them at your local produce store or pet food store even. Um, and they're automatic watering fillers. So you can just attach them to a bucket, a 20 litre bucket like that and it'll last a really long time. One of the issues I have with chook water is it gets dirty because they're always digging and splashing and making a big mess. Whereas if you have something like that on a bucket propped up on a couple of bricks, um, easy to clean because they're very small. Um, and it means they've got endless supply of nice cold fresh water. It means you can pop some ice blocks in that bucket. So if it is going to be 40 degree day, the water coming out there is really nice and cold. So that's my little heat wave tip. Now I'm just going to check my, hopefully you can see me in my Um, a couple of other things that I have. As I mentioned before, mites. Now you can get some hardcore chemicals that will control mites if you have an outbreak uh, and wormers and things. And there are times that you will need to use the hardcore chemicals. But of course, most of us don't like using hardcore chemicals. Um, so one thing that I do to control mites, particularly in their beds, is I get rosemary and I've actually started planting rosemary and lavender throughout the yard as well. But I'll get sprigs of rosemary and sprigs of lavender and basically just strip all the leaves off and put that all through their bed. So I wonder if, I'll just unplug my speaker, might be able to see. In there, just like that. So I've got sawdust or wood shavings in their bed and then all that beautiful rosemary and lavender through there. And what that does, sunshine, <laughs> what that does is, yeah, it does make it smell better, but it's all those essential oils, which you'll know as soon as you strip about 10 of these, your hands will be so oily. Um, 
and, and sticky, but all those beautiful essential oils repel the mites. So not only do they get the essential oils on their body, which helps repel the mites from crawling onto them at night, but as those essential oils start to seep into the wood um, around the coop, that also can prevent mites. So the more prevention you do, the less treatment you need to do for an outbreak. Something else that I'm starting to do now I'm using, this is called a Biomix. It looks a bit like a Bikashi bin. Um, it's a bucket. It's a bucket with a filter and recipes <laughs> um, that you then ferment all your rosemary and lavender in and use it as a spray um, around your yard. So have a think about some of the DIY uh, potions that you could make rather than buying essential oils, which is what I used to do. It's really expensive. Um, have a think about what you can actually make at home from your garden that you can then spray to treat your timber and so forth. Um, that can really help keep them at bay as well. So um, that's sort of the, the lowdown on coccidia, on mites, uh, some of those other things. Now, just as my little reminder, I've got a couple of backgrounds that I want to show you as well. Before I do that, I just want to show you my fox proofing. So another important, um, another important part of, uh, you know, keeping chickens well-being, um, happy, happiness, healthiness, is them not having a fear. So fear, stress, shock can kill them. So controlling um, some of those fears that mostly are very rational um, is often very easy to do. They, as I mentioned, are prey, prey species. So there are always predators out to get them. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm under a really big tree, beautiful big tree, which not only gives us beautiful shade in summer, um, but really, really hard for an eagle, a wedge-tailed eagle, or even a goshawk to fly down and steal a chook. Um, so it gives them a great sense of security because they don't have open sky above them. If you don't have uh, a big tree like this, um, even this purple table behind me can offer some protection. They will feel safe because they can go under that. Uh, and small shrubs, so lavender bushes and rosemary bushes, kill two birds with one stone, don't kill birds. <laughs> but you can um, plant those bushes in your chook yard, not only for those beautiful essential oils to keep parasites away, but as little hidey holes for the chickens to get under as well. So um, have a think about some of those things that you can offer them protection from above. So not just from weather, but from actual predators above. Um, goshawks are one of the main predators of chooks and um, even even in the middle of queue, you will get raptors, birds of prey, um, able to come and steal chooks. I've heard of little dogs being taken. So um, having that bit of security for them. In a perfect world, you would actually enclose your whole chook yard with wire to keep out the wild birds as well, because that's who brings in most of the parasites and diseases. Um, but for me, it's not practical with a big tree. So um, yeah, we just do our best with um, not leaving food out for the wild birds uh, and giving them protection from the raptors. Now, fox proofing. Hopefully, you can hear me. Just in case you can't hear me, I'll come a bit closer. So that's a poly pipe um, that I've installed. I've only obviously just started fox proofing because um, I do lock the chooks up every night, but um, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to have to lock them up every night because I often have a toddler asleep on me. So um, I live in a practical world where I want to make it easy for myself. So what I've done is I've seen the, the possum spinners and things that you can get for the top of fences. They're really expensive. I thought, I wonder if that will work with polypipe. And I've seen other examples on the web of people using polypipe. So I just got a couple of brackets, just shelving brackets, just an L shape. 
um, and mounted them at the right height on the fence, um, put the poly pipe on, screwed it all on, and um, now if a fox tries to climb that, it'll just spin. So fox can't go over, which is really, really good. Um, foxes can still go under, so um, you can do a skirt with your fence as well. So basically, if you've got your fence coming down like that, a skirt means bringing it out sideways. So you don't have to dig down and dig your fence really deep. Just bring, bring a flap out to the side and then cover it with soil, and that's enough to stop a fox digging in. So I'm just going to quickly change my background so that you can see a little bit about safety from predators while I readjust my position. So just some examples of chook houses <laughs> where chooks don't necessarily feel very safe because they're out in the open and exposed. And you can see here in this video, there's a goshawk actually trying to get into the chooks and the chooks are freaking out um, and panicking because they don't feel very safe, but luckily they've managed to get into their house and the goshawk couldn't get in. And then it'll move on to another example in just a sec of a fox being chased away by the family dog. You can see the hook, I ducked my head nice and low, you can see the hook there still trying to get in. Uh, and so here's a lovely example of um, chooks feeling nice and safe on that my building of Cryptopia, <laughs> safety from pets. So I've always had dogs. Um, you can teach your dogs not to attack chooks. We, um, <laughs> we got to the stage with our dogs that the chooks and dogs could come inside. Um, <laughs> pardon me. But um, yeah, it just, it just takes a bit of time and a bit of training, but it can be done. So if someone says, oh, I can't have, I don't have chooks because I've got dogs or I've got cats. Um, you just have to have a decent fence to begin with and the rest will follow. Um, so this is just a fox that's tried to get into the chook yard. The chooks were out free ranging and fortunately the family dog has been able to uh, spot the commotion and come flying out and scare off, scare off the fox. Um, we can't all be that lucky. I have lost chooks to foxes in the past because my dogs have been sound asleep on the on the bed inside, so um, you can't completely rely on your dogs to keep foxes away, but it can be a deterrent. Now, I just, I mentioned heat before as well, so I'll just show you a beautiful example of a school that I did a workshop at recently. Uh, they had chicken wire all up on the roof, and as you can see, um, they've got vines then growing up over the chicken wire. It was a really hot day, it was high 30s, I think, when we were in there, but it was about five degrees cooler when we walked inside because of that beautiful breeze. So the natural cooling effect of plants is so much more effective than natural cooling effect of a building. Um, so if you can build some sort of a shelter or structure over your chook yard like that, then it's ideal. Okay. So I'm just going to go to my next screen. Another thing I mentioned too is you can put uh, things in their water like garlic and apple cider vinegar and that really helps their gut with internal parasites. Um, when it comes to worming them, I don't like to put wormer in their water and take away their other water. One, I find that really, really hard to do because they just, they'll starve themselves. They won't drink the water. And they, I'm not convinced that they get enough of a dose. So the two options that I've found effective for worming, one is um, to make up the right concentration and just quickly squirt it into their mouth with a syringe. Um, it's traumatic for about half a second and then it's done and dusted as opposed to 48 hours of, oh my God, they're gonna die because they're not drinking any water. Um, and the other option, which you can work out with your vet, uh, there are a lot of topical um, liquids that you can get, like what you'd put on the back of a cat or a dog to treat fleas and mites and things. Um, you can get them for chickens as well. Um, most of them available commercially, like you know, through a pet supply store, um, it would be an off-label use, which is illegal. But if you go through your vet, they can actually make up the right concentration um, in a legal dose. And 
Someone's just asking the thoughts on keeping the compost pile in the chooks. Um, I missed the second half of the question, but I've got, I'm not sure if you can see here, I've got a compost bin in here. Um, so I find it's really useful. One, if I didn't, I don't think I'd clean out the chooks nearly as often. <laughs> so again, it's about making it easy for yourself. Um, but two, I find um, there aren't really any crossovers with the bugs and the issues that can affect chooks with what will go on in the compost bin. So I find it's a really good, good balance, good relationship. Um, anything I've missed on that, we'll come back to at the end of the session because I, I can see there's quite a few questions in chat now. Um, so I'm going to now go to oh, share my screen again. Just to run through the council requirements. Um, so in terms of the council requirements, sorry, my, uh, my phone keeps trying to talk to my computer and I've told it to, <laughs> to leave me alone. Um, so the intent of most councils local laws relating to pets is to prevent nuisance so you know it's not about councils wanting to be party poopers and saying no you can't have 600 chooks you know no matter how sustainable you think it might be um it's it's about preventing nuisance to neighbors so keeping complaints to a minimum keeping you know stopping disease uh smell and so forth so every council will have slightly different requirements. So if any of you aren't from Borondara, um, look up your own council's website. But common things that you'll see in the local law will be about preventing smell and vermin from affecting your neighbours. So not leaving food out because you could get mice and rats. Um, <clears throat> they will all generally have requirements around the number of chooks you can keep, which we'll look at on the next slide. Um, many will even state coop requirements. So some councils will say the coop can't be a certain, it has to be a certain distance from the fence. So you can't have it right on your neighbor's fence. Um, some councils will say that uh, you need to have a concrete floor in it, not a dirt floor. And again, that's about keeping disease at bay. Um, birds can carry a lot of disease. Um, and I'm sure we're a lot more acutely aware now with COVID, um, the, I think it's called zoonic, zootonic, um, how diseases can jump between animals and humans. Um, what most of the guidelines are around is being able to keep a hygienic environment because it's not a natural environment to have chooks living so closely to us. You know, um, in nature, sort of before the modernised world, um, you know, chooks would have been wild and people wouldn't have lived that close to them, gone and collect their eggs, hunted them from afar. Um, whereas now it's much more intensive. We're a lot closer to a high number of animals. Uh, and so the, the chance of catching diseases um, and even just parasites crossing across um, is a lot more uh, of an issue. Um, of course, there's the noise issue too, which is why most councils will say you can't have roosters and noisy birds. Um, dust is an issue. One thing chooks really, really, really need, especially in heat, is an area of dust to dust bathe in. I'm just going to unshare for a sec. So these guys are all down here scratching around in the dirt. So it's really important sensory um, factor for them to be able to uh, scratch around in dirt and look for food and bugs, uh, it gives them extra nutrition, but also to be able to fluff around, fluff dust up into their feathers, uh, that controls mites and cools them down. So having an area to dust bathe is much, much, much more important than having an area of lawn, uh, as much as we as humans would much prefer a bit of lawn, um, you just need to accept with chooks that you're going to have dust patches. So again, that can impact your neighbours, so especially if it's windy. So just thinking about that type of thing. Um, so in terms of Borondara and what you can have, um, so Borondara is great because they've actually spelled it right out across a range of different birds. You can actually have five farm animals. Um, which is really cool. Where I am, you have to be on acreage to have farm animals. 
Um, you can't have any roosters at all or pea or guinea fowl. And I would imagine that's simply a noise factor. Um, chickens or pheasants, you can have, if you're in a house with a backyard up to six, but if you're in a unit, apartment or any property that is sharing uh, sort of common ground um, or you know multiple households with on the one title, uh, then you can't have any. So um, that's when you need to get friendly with your neighbours <laughs> and keep some there or look at having some at a community garden or local school. Um, or you could have uh, a couple of turkeys, ducks or geese. I imagine the number's lower because turkeys, ducks and geese have higher needs in terms of amount of area that they need as well as area they destroy. <laughs> They're very destructive, especially ducks. Um, if you don't want lawn at all, get ducks. <laughs> they will destroy it. Um, other poultry not specified, you could have four or caged birds, which is things like, you know, an aviary with lorikeets and things would be 20. So I don't know that that is all inclusive. Um, so for example, if you have six chickens, can you have two turkeys? I would suggest probably not. I would say it's one or the other. Um, so yeah, but six chickens is a really good size flock to have. A lot of people ask me what size um, flock they should start with. I would always recommend starting with no less than three birds. So if you have three chickens and one dies, you've still got two chickens. So there's not too much stress, there's some company, but when you go to introduce more chickens, you need to introduce two, you can't introduce just one. So then you'll have four and then if one dies, you've got three and that's fine for a while until you've got two and then you do it again. Whereas if you start with two and one dies, you've got a very stressed, lonely chicken. Or if you start with six and one dies or you for some reason want to introduce one more, you can't really introduce just one because it'll get attacked, but you can't introduce two because it'll bring you up over the six. So um, yeah, a good number for the average household would be, I'd start with a minimum of three, three, four or five. Um, now we're getting towards question time. I'm just gonna check my next slide, sorry. Um, I just wanted to share with you some resources. I've got um, a Chook fact sheet on um, the Chooktopia website that um, basically gives you the overview of the different things that we've talked about today in terms of what chooks need for social interaction, for stimulation, where to even buy chooks, because um, it can be quite hard to find them. I know during COVID, a lot of people were having trouble finding chooks. Um, but when you've got questions about chooks, short of going straight to a bird vet rather than just a regular vet, because birds are hard, um, so you need a bird vet, um, have a look at the backyard poultry groups, both on social media and on very various blogs, because there's some amazing resources out there. There's really, really knowledgeable people. I find I turn to them a lot as well. Um, so yeah, don't feel like, um, you have to know everything. I still don't feel like I know everything. Um, so yeah, I will still consult quite a lot of people uh, and sort of get a bit of a consensus uh, before getting too, too hung up on, um, on what's going on. And when it comes to your local council, when you're doing a search in the website, if you search for chooks on a council website, you're not gonna find it. So look up things like poultry uh, or fowl um, generally to find your own, um, information. So why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> so we've got a little bit of time for questions and then I'm going to hand over, once we've answered some of the questions, I'm going to hand over to Liz who's going to run through the um, some of council's information but we've got we've got a good sort of 20 minutes, half an hour to get into those nitty gritty questions now. Uh, and then, um, yeah, make sure that we've got sort of a good five or 10 minutes at the end because Liz has got a bit more information to share with you. Now, I'm just, I missed that question. So I'm gonna open up the chat and work my way from the top because hopefully a lot of things have been already answered. Uh, so we talked about the best laying hands. Oh, great. Someone else has got some frizzles. So um, frizzles, it's a genetic mutation. I know this isn't really a question, but uh, 
is a genetic mutation that causes frizzling, which is where the feathers flick out. Now, next to the red stool, there's a little red stool with a chook on top of it. The little black and white chook standing right next to the red stool is a frizzle. Um, and it's, imagine the 80s style haircut where it's all flicked out, you know, sort of perm it and flick it out. All the feathers are like that. It's a genetic mutation, but gosh, it looks cute. Um, but you can't breed frizzles with frizzles. Um, you start to end up with naked chooks and all sorts of genetic issues. So um, yeah, a one-off is, is pretty cute, but try not to get a pair. Um, so do they molt seasonally? Yes, they do. So I find, I tend to get, um, two sort of two obvious molting seasons during a year um at other times too so there can be business in a year uh, and you'll know because there'll be feathers every and look like an egg uh like a almost like a big chocolate mousse. <laughs> um, so yes, it can um, look like all sorts of different things. Sorry, I've got more things popping up on my screen. Um, yeah, someone feeds theirs crickets, someone feeds theirs bananas. Yes, I'll even give mine banana peel and they'll pretty much take out all the inside of the peel before I then pop that in the compost. Uh, another great reason to have a compost bin in the chook yard uh, is to then scrape it all up and pop it in the into the compost bin once you've finished. Um, now it says here, I notice citrus in the bucket. Will chooks leave food that's not good for them? Yes, they will. So they won't touch the citrus in here. Um, they'll just leave that on the ground. So I'll need to rake that up and pop that in the compost if um, if the sheep don't need it. I don't know if you can hear the sheep in the background, but I think they'll dive in on it. Anyway, they keep trying to tell me they're hungry even when they've been fed. Um, oh yes, and they will eat mice. So if you do have um, mice or rats start to make a home in your chook yard, you do want to jump on it very quickly, but maybe not with your traditional chemicals. Uh, you'll find that chooks will catch, kill and eat mice and sometimes even rats. Conversely, rats can catch, kill and eat your chooks. So um, yeah, try not to encourage rats. The best way is to have um, a feeder. I'll just grab an example. So rather than having feed just on the ground that attracts wild birds and rodents and things, um, all sorts of different feeders. Rodents can still get into here, but it's easy to pick it up and put it away and wash it and so forth. You can actually get rodent proof feeders. So um, it's a, a metal feeder where the chooks have to stand on a little lever, which lifts the lid for them to feed on and a rat's not heavy enough, but a chook is. So you can get some really amazing feeders out there, but really just not leaving food lying around is the key to not having chooks get them. Um, someone else feeds theirs prime dog loaf. Yes. And if I've got a chicken that's quite poorly, I'll give it some cat food. Um, cat food's really, really high in protein. So that tends to do an amazing job to, to give them a bit of a pick me up. Uh, and I get them some, yeah, give them some of that just as a treat every now and again. Uh, the next question is how do you balance garden conservation, garden preservation with the chickens? Chicken's interest in digging. <laughs> really good fences. <laughs> um, you can see here, I've got mine all fenced in now. Mine used to have free range of the whole backyard. And apart from the fox issue, uh, and that we did have a sparrow hawk hanging around a lot, wanting to steal them. Uh, we just had no grass at all and they were digging up, constantly digging up garden beds. So we've decided to fence in a patch. I used to keep my chickens a lot further from the house uh, in a fence patch, but sort of out of sight, out of mind, you know, they didn't get as nice food. I didn't change their water as much. I didn't think to collect their eggs as much. Um, whereas now having them so close to the house, I'm in here every day, spending time with them. I notice if something's wrong. Um, 
Oh, and that's what I was going to show you, the other waterers and things as well. Um, again, having such a busy lifestyle, there's so many different hacks that you can use to, um, to keep food and water happening. Now, over here. We've got these waterers. Um, these are the same ones that we put out for the fires. We did some volunteer work out at East Gippsland, putting out waterers for wildlife, and we're so impressed with them um, that we ended up building a few for here. So basically, each of these posts holds about 11 litres of water, and you can see at the bottom it's just kind of a little J. So to fill them, you turn them upside down and stick a hose in, fill them up on top, and then turn them over. Uh, it's gravity fed, but there's enough um, sort of suction or a vacuum uh, in the tube that stops the water just from running out, provided it's well sealed. So I've got, what's that, 30 litres plus my 20 litre bucket. So, you know, I'm safe to go and leave my chooks for maybe a week um, without having to change their food or water. Uh, this one here is a feeder. I've actually just pinched this from the emu paddock because they couldn't self-regulate and they ate the whole tube's worth in about 10 minutes. So <laughs> this is coming in to be uh, for the chalks. But what I have found is uh, it would need to be in a completely waterproof area because the rain can get straight into, into that. But again, that's another way to not have food laying around. Um, can you give them raw mints? Um, Look, I have, I probably probably wouldn't give them raw mints that's gone off. Um, I have had mints and chicken in the fridge that I've sort of thought might be past its date uh, that I've cooked and then given to them just to kill any, any bugs, any salmonella and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, fresh raw mints will be fine. It's no different to them, you know, if, if an animal dies and it's, this it sounds really disgusting, but if it's writhing with maggots, the chooks will just dive on it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it can't be as bad as that. <laughs> um, leaving food that's not good for them. Oh, that's a, the same question again from somebody. Do I feed the whole eggshell and yolk? Yes. So I'm just seeing if there's any remnants left. I'll grab a bit. So this is um, one that I fed them earlier. So I tend to just break it. I've got a couple of logs down here on the ground and I tend to just break it on the log and then leave the yolk in the shell and I'll just drink the yolk out of the shell and then I'll just leave, leave the eggshells on the ground. Eventually they'll probably end up in the compost um, or get trampled or whatever, but the chooks will eat bits of them. So um, yeah, that's fine. And like I said, I've never had an issue with them confusing them with the whole ones that are in the nest. So, throw that back to them. Um, do the dust bugs actually help prevent mites? Yes, they do. So, um, the mites, it's a lot harder for them to stick to the chickens when they're all, all dusty and slippery, and they're also um, sort of shaking them off as they're fluffing around in there. So, it really does help prevent the mites. Um, next question. Oh, someone spotted the emu in the backyard. Yeah, the essential oils, um, someone just commented, uh, are a really good but a very expensive way to do it. So by crushing down your own lavender, one thing you can do is um, if you've got the time or maybe, you know, you've got some bored kids, <laughs> get them to sit there with the snippers and actually cut it right down. But by just stripping all the, the leaves off the lavender and the rosemary, um, you'll be able to smell it. It smells amazing. It, uh, it's really, really effective. Uh, apple cider vinegar and water spray. So Zoom user, um, the water, oh, sorry, I, I understand. I thought you were doing a vinegar spray as well. But yeah, the water spray for the heat and the apple cider vinegar, really, really good for the gut. Um, the, all the flora, microflora in the gut um, is really helped by the apple cider vinegar. It's quite hard to get them to eat it, but you can mix it in a bit of pollard and that sort of thing, which makes them 
you know, really a lot more palatable. Uh, and someone has just mentioned foxes in Borondara. I can guarantee you there are more foxes per square kilometre somewhere like Borondara than here on the farm. Um, so we're in Lang Warren, southeast suburbs. Um, and at one stage, there was a map done that showed a much, much greater density, not Borondara, but in South Yarra, uh, was one of the highest density fox populations around Melbourne. So don't think because you're in the suburbs that you're safe from foxes, um, you're actually a lot less safe because it, they've got a much easier life in the burbs. People live out cat food and dog food. It's just, everything's easy. They've got warm places to sleep, warm places to hide, ample food everywhere. There are foxes galore, uh, whereas they have to work a lot harder out here. Um, yeah, if someone's put up a shade sale, that's a really good idea. Um, the question for the skirt on the fence, um, I only run my skirt out about, what's that, 60 centimetres. Um, so when you're, so you build, build your fence to keep your foxes out uh, and you can build something really slippery that they just can't climb. That's another way to do it. So something like, um, a bit like the, the laser light, but not the corrugated one, the flat one. Uh, it's, as long as they just can't get their hands over the, their hands, their paws over the top. Um, so you've got something slippery there and then your wire coming out, probably a metre would be ideal, but yeah, I only go about 60 centimetres. So whatever's on the wire roll. <laughs> Do the chickens attract snakes? Uh, that's a really good question. Not in my experience. Um, if anything, the chickens would probably alert you to the snakes because they'd make a heck of a lot of noise. Um, the really big chickens down there, the emus, um, they, they eat snakes. So um, yeah, we tend not to really have snake issues there. I do find on a lot of the forums up north, the chickens attract snakes because the pythons coming to eat the eggs. But down here, I, I haven't heard of a lot of anecdotes to that effect. Um, I suppose the snakes that we get down around Melbourne are more looking for live moving prey. I don't know, but not that chickens aren't, but um, you know, in terms of the eggs. Yeah, it's a really good question that I'll need to do a bit more research into. Um, and if I find out, I'll, I'll blog it for you. In fact, I'll ask our local snake catcher, you'll know, because he he, kept, he does all the snake catches around here. Do foxes attack in the daytime? Yes, they do. Um, so whilst it's less common for them to attack in the daytime, they will attack any time, day or night. It, um, a lot of factors are involved. And one is how, how hard the competition is in the area. Sometimes a young male fox might have been pushed out of its current uh, area by by the alpha male uh, and so it's it'll do whatever it can do to just get by um, so yeah definitely I've uh, had quite a lot of friends lose chooks during the daytime to foxes um, now oh this is the question I started to answer before um, keeping a compost pile in the chook pen and the second part of the question was do chooks keep the cockies down does that mean the cockroaches or cockatoos, Sarah? She might have dropped out. Um, so I'm not too sure what's meant by that question. Um, chooks will definitely keep the bugs down though. If raising chickens from eggs, what do you do with the roosters? Um, personally, because I can have roosters because I'm on property, I integrate them to the flock. Um, in a, in a perfect world, if people just ate the roosters, um, you know, the one, less, one less factory farmed chook, you know, that's ended up on the dinner table, like that, that's the ideal is if people just eat the roosters. Um, so, and you could potentially um, find a property like this that was willing to house the rooster until it was fat enough. Um, but any, any rooster rescue you send it to, with the exception of Edgar's mission and, and a few other places, um, pretty much guarantee, I'm gonna have to plug in my computer in a sec or it's gonna die, um, pretty much guarantee that um, most will end up just sending them to market. Reason being is a rooster, you can't generally just house roosters together. You can't just add them to the flock. Uh, they generally will want their own flock. So they'll need their whole, they'll need 
their own yard, their own house, their own flock, uh, and they don't lay eggs, they just need food. So they end up just costing a lot of money. Um, I did a bit of re rooster rescue for a really long time, um, but I just don't have the setup for it at the moment. Uh, and we never killed any of our roosters, but eventually the fox got in and got a lot of them because we just couldn't keep fencing off more and more areas. So the fencing wasn't quite adequate. <laughs> um, communal gardens could definitely benefit from from chooks. Now I'm just going to change my background so that you don't get too dizzy because I'm going to need to plug in my computer before it goes to sleep. Um, I'll just pop it on any old slide. Um, just so that it doesn't die midway through because Liz still has her bit to do and I'm sure we've still got a few more questions to go through. Another question that hasn't come up yet is um, how do you put chooks to bed at night? <laughs> they, again, generally they will put themselves to bed, but the issue that I have with my young chooks is they've been moved to their new area without, um, without being locked up in their new area for the first few nights. So they still haven't quite got the memo that they're meant to go to bed. <laughs> so every night I'm out there rounding them up and chasing them of me chasing them. All right, I'm just going to plug in. Ah, the beauty of technology. Okay, now it's happy. Um, would, uh, this is probably a question for Liz to, to take back um, to the waste team when they're building future strategies. Would Borondara consider a communal chook nook for people in a multi-dwelling, multi-unit dwelling address? So I guess, um, yeah, supporting community gardens maybe to, to have community chook areas um, for people. Um, and there's a link from Liz there. I, Pretty sure you can do a save of the chat questions too by pressing the little three dots, everybody. Um, are, <laughs> are rock pigeons exempt? They're good for medieval recipes. Uh, I imagine they would class as the caged birds. Um, common compost bins, garden plots, would, there would be stuff to, places to put chooks in the dark shadowy spots. Um, so Sarah, that, um, that question might be a good one to apply to council. So when I say that you can't have chooks in a multi-unit dwelling, um, what, um, what that means is without a permit, you can't have chooks in a multi-unit dwelling. So you could apply for a permit uh, and what council will then do um, on the link that Liz put up there just before. Um, they will then consult with all your neighbours and, and weigh up all the pros and cons and apply for a permit uh, in that situation. Um, keeping an eye on the time, but I'll try to get through all these questions before I hand over to Liz. Um, is it possible to keep healthy chooks without commercial feeds? 100% it is. Um, so if you've got ample garden for them to dig around and get all their um, you know, all their bugs and grubs, uh, so their protein, they need the protein. And then um, obviously all the other nutrients, their fruits and veg and so forth. Um, so all their carbs, then ab absolutely, you don't need commercial feed. I just supplement because I've got a fair few chooks in a smallish yard. Uh, and yeah, I, you know, until I've got more plants and things in there and a bit more biodiversity, I think oh, they could probably use a bit of supplementation and also with the, with the babies. Uh, how many chooks do I have? Oh, that's a good question. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14, including the turkey, <laughs> whose name is Goose. <laughs> he's such a goose. Um, is there a good off the shelf chook house pen option to buy? Oh, excellent question. Now that I'm inside, um, you'll have to visualize back to the chook house 
um, out there. So that one I bought um, off a local guy and I spent way too much. It was about $900. There, uh, there's someone on the Mornington Peninsula that does the same chill cast for around five or $600. Any of the off-the-shelf ones are made from fir wood, which is really, really soft. You can snap it with your hands. A fox can get straight in. But that little bedding on the side that I've got is one of those fir wood ones and um, pretty old now and in pretty poor repair. Still holding strong. So, yeah, off-the-shelf, probably maybe look more into the metal ones. So you took tractor type ones. There's one called a chook igloo that I haven't tried yet, but I think that's plastic and metal. Just steer away from the fir wood, that really lightweight wood. Um, and then we covered that cook looking like an egg. Oh, Philip, I'm sad you're not going to go on with having chooks. Once you've set it all up, it's really easy, but you just need to be mindful of all these things because you don't want them to to suffer. Um, in a suburban backyard, will a good chook house be enough protection for foxes and hawks without the chooks getting stressed out? Um, yeah, a good chook house. Um, so something like um, what I've got out there is much, much the same as a cubby house. So, you know, if you convert a cubby house into a chook house and build a yard uh, and then, you know, if you fence off the roof of that yard, that's more than adequate for, for chooks in suburbia. Um, someone else is asked, they've got four chooks, two died, so then I have two. One is a rooster. Should I keep the rooster when I get new chooks. If you're in an area where you can have a rooster, 100% keep the rooster. They are so good for the dynamic, the social dynamic. Um, and if a fox does come, the rooster will sacrifice itself. So, um, you know, it'll try to fight it off to protect the flock. So if you are living somewhere where you can have a rooster, definitely keep the rooster. Um, if you're not, then, then move it on. But um, yeah, depends on where you are really. Um, shell grit or eggshells, yes, so I didn't mention that, but when I feed the eggshells to my chooks, um, they're getting that extra calcium. There's also extra calcium in the pellets that we give them. Uh, and uh, the, if they eat little bits of sort of grain and sand and that type of thing, that really helps them digest it because they, they use it in their crop to kind of rub the food together. Um, Someone's asked about clipping the wings. I personally don't clip wings because I have very high fences. Um, but yes, you, you can definitely clip the wings. Jump on and watch some video tutorials online. Um, don't just attempt it um, because you can do a bit of damage if you do it wrong or cut too close. So um, yeah, just grab your information. Uh, we have an avocado tree. Will they eat the leaves and bark that are harmful to them? I don't think they would, to be honest. Um, I don't feed mine avocado because my worms get that in the worm farm. Uh, so yeah, I don't think they'd eat it. I, I haven't noticed them eating other leaves and um, bark in general. So uh, yes, there's emus in the background. Very big chooks. Um, run seems fairly yard, uh, large. Um, so it was, I can't even remember how many chooks I've counted in there now but uh, yeah it is quite large so it's two four six eight it's probably about eight by eight meters roughly um so yeah quite large oh cockroaches um yes they probably will eat the cockroaches especially sorry this is going back to Sarah's question from earlier with having a compost pile in the chook yard um will the chooks eat the cockies uh they will uh, the baby cockroaches are so nutritious um so yeah the chooks will go crazy for them so that's absolutely fine um do Amy step on chooks more if they are if they used to be in the same paddock um not really they tend to be pretty swift <laughs> underfoot. Um, Michael, one of our chooks does clear liquidy excretia quite often. Is this a problem? Without seeing it, I don't really know. Um, so maybe grab a photo and see if you can compare it on some of the forums, on the chook poo forums, just to compare because it, it could be a number of different things. Um, 
conscious of the time, we've still got a lot of questions and Liz's bit. So what I might do is I'll, I'll jump across so that Liz can run through her bit and then I'll jump back on to questions so that those that then need to go can go and those that are waiting for their question to be answered, I'll stick around and answer those. Um, so bear with me and I will just get my screen up for Liz. Okay, so I'm just going to hand over to Liz for just a moment uh, or five or ten minutes and then I'll come back to the remaining questions. Oh, lovely. Thanks very much, Ella. Um, I'm aware that we do have more questions to get through, so I'll try not to take up too much time. Um, as I said, uh, I run a lot of in community engagement with the residents around uh, environmental sustainability. Council runs a number of services and projects to support you directly. Um, we might just start moving through the slides quickly, Ella. Now, some of the resources that we do offer, we run an annual Backyard Biodiversity Program. This is a great program that will step you through how to encourage native wildlife into your backyard. Uh, jump online. I will, after the workshop, I will send out an email and I'll provide all the links to all of these resources for you. So don't feel like you have to take notes as we go along. Thanks, Ella. We also offer, there's been a lot of talk um, during the workshop about having compost bins in your chookyard. Council does subsidise the cost of um, compost bins, worm farms and um, pet poo compost bins, pet poo digesters, some people call them, and bakashi bins through the Compost Revolution Service. You get up to 40% off recommended retail and free delivery. We also, next slide, thanks, Ella. I'll just go through them quite quickly in the, to save time. We also offer a free energy advice service through the Australian Energy Foundation. You can give them a call or you can actually book in online for a free 20-minute energy consultation. So that's a great resource. Next. Yes, and we run um, an annual sustainability workshop program, which this workshop is part of. We have another couple of workshops coming up, one of which is reducing food waste, um, about how to make your own passata and chutney, and it's a really great um, cooking class where you can cook along with our presenter. If you do want to know more about these workshops, you can either jump onto our website or you can sign up to our e-news list and we will send you out the links to all the upcoming workshops so you can book in. Stay in touch, how do you know what we're up to? Well, Council website's always a really good resource. We have our Burundara Bulletin, which is a monthly magazine online and hard copy. It's a really, really great magazine and well worth a look if you do come across it. Feel free to join our Council Facebook group. It's quite active. We have our Living for Our Future e-newsletter. I will send out the link so you can sign up for that and you'll just find out when we have new resources, subsidies, special offers. Or you can contact us the old-fashioned way. You can give us a call or you can just send us an email at Burundara. At Burundara. So um, I'm just going to say thank you very much to all of you for giving us your time this evening. And I'm also going to say thanks to Ella. That was great. Really great to have you outside amongst where it's all happening, amongst all the action. Um, and I'll hand back to you, Ella, so you can finish off those questions. No worries. Okay. So. Um, got to find out where we're up to because it's scrolled me right to the bottom. Uh, so I'll scroll back up. Do you think the deep litter technique for the base of the chook pen is effective? Um, was the next question. That again, that's a really good question. We've had a go at doing it here. Um, again, I'm not an expert and I'm not a scientist, but something that I'm conscious of is the there's several diseases that can get into the soil uh, when you have any birds sort of in intensive captivity. And um, whilst the deep litter is effective uh, in giving them somewhere to scratch and, you know, has amazing benefits, I do wonder that as pathogens and things build up 
is that going to be an issue long term? So, um, yeah, for me, the jury's still out on that. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's probably better than just plain dirt, which is what I've got at the moment <laughs> because we've recently moved our chook house. Um, and someone's asked, what would you use to create deep litter? Again, if other people have, want to chime in, um, you can pop your comments in into the chat as well, because um, that peer-to-peer -peer learning um, is, you know, really effective. Um, personally, to use the to create the deep litter, I use a lot of the pine wood shavings because the there's sort of the, the saps or the essential oils in the pine um, are quite good, you know, not quite as good as things like your lavender, but there's still um, some benefits in those um, natural resins at keeping away um, parasites. Um, how often would you need to clear it? Look, it would depend on the size, how many chooks you have, how full of poop it is, um, lots of different factors. Um, Stand and sort us and sweep it up each week. Yeah, that's probably not a bad idea. The best chook bedding was a question from Anne. Um, I like using either a really soft grass hay or the wood shavings, um, just because I find they're easy to work with. They're nice and soft on the chooks, they're easy to clean, but I do sprinkle them um, as intensively as I can, like as high a concentration as I can uh, with the lavender and the rosemary. Uh, also, you can sprinkle in things like diametaceous earth uh, and lime. That's a really good way to, again, help keep the mites at bay. Uh, and one remedy I've heard of for a really severe mite infestation um, is to go really thick on the lime through the whole floor of the chook house. So that's one to think of. Um, how big in metres should you have for a chook house for three chooks? I think it's nice to have. A square meter per chook. Um, the law says it can be a lot less than that so um, it will partly come down to your own sort of your personal views. I like to allow about a meter per chook but now that I have so many chooks I sort of get to a, a point where the house isn't going to get any bigger um, and I'll just you know not let the population grow anymore. Um, so mine probably isn't one chook per meter for the house, but the whole yard, they've definitely got a square meter each. Um, scrolling down. No, so um, Luz, no, you don't need eight by eight meters for three chooks. Um, so mine's about eight by eight meters and I've got 12, 14, something like that. Um, and I could probably fit double in there comfortably. So, yeah, you um you don't need nearly as much space. They do need somewhere to scratch, somewhere to run. So as long as you tick off that checklist, which if you download off the resources I showed you just before on the Chooktopia website, you can download the fact sheet. It's a two page sort of summary of what we've covered in this section, but it does tick off, you know, somewhere to scratch, somewhere to roost, somewhere to lay the eggs. Um, as long as you've got all those elements, then, the space is less of an issue. Um, so, yes. Now that is all the questions, I think. Yes. All right, any other questions that anyone would like to throw in? Well, who wants to know why the chicken crossed the road? I'm assuming that's a yes. Yeah. All right. So the, the chicken did not cross the road, the road passed beneath the chicken, Einstein. <laughs> Who would like to come up with a saying for someone famous? No, you're all still quiet. That's all good. Well, I just wanted to say thanks so much for coming along. Um, I know it's a, a beautiful day and quite tempting to sit out on the porch and, and have a drink and, and relax. So thanks so much for taking the time out to come along and learn about keeping chickens. I hope I've answered your questions. Like I said, you know, I'm not an expert. I never will be. Um, I'm forever learning. So um, yeah, keep on learning and keep on asking questions and sharing advice with each other. Thank you.